is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the said the Lord, Jesus, Jesus. to see everybody this morning. Welcome to Central. If you're visiting with us, you are truly our honored guest. And if you are visiting with us, there's a white card on the pew in front of you. Reco uh, encourage you to fill one of those out, please, and just leave it in the pew beside you. We'll have someone pick those up at the end of the services this morning. Um, just a reminder, we start at 9 o'clock for Bible study on Sunday mornings, 10 o'clock worship service, 5 o'clock evening services, and on Wednesday, at 10 o'clock a.m. Um, Bible study and also 6.30 p.m. service. Um, again, it's good to see everybody. Um, I had one other thing on my mind. I can't think of it. Uh, anyway, let's get back to our worship service. All right. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find and you will find rest for your souls. I found my Lord and he is mine. He won me by his love. I'll serve him through the years of time and dwell with him above. His yoke is
Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, teaching them to do observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Anywhere with Jesus I can say. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are, you are our Father. We are, the, we are the clay and you are the potter. And all we are the work of your hand.
bow with me, please. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we come today to sing praise us to you and hear your word. We thank you, Lord, for your son who was so willing to go to the cross and die, Lord, not just for us here, but for everyone in this world. All can have salvation and eternal life with him. Father, we, we just thank you for all your blessings upon us. Father, we pray, Lord, for those that are unable to be here today. For whatever reason, Lord, many are sick. Some are at work. Some just didn't come. But we pray for them, Lord, that they too will find the importance of being here to hear thy word, to sing praises. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for our first responders, the police, the fire department, the paramedics, the doctors and the nurses that tend to our needs. Father, we're just so thankful for your grace. Father, we pray, Lord, for this country. We're coming into a time where we're looking at new prospects, new candidates to, that are possibly a new president. And we pray, Lord, that we all make the right choice and elect the individual that will serve our country, serve the people of this country. Father, we thank you for the, the wonderful weather we've had this past week. Some of us got rain, some of us didn't. We just ask that you continue to provide as you always have. Be with this church, Lord. We thank you for the elders that do a, a wonderful job of leading us, Lord. Ask them that, that you inspire them, Lord, in all that they do. Be with them, watching over them as well as watching over us. We thank you and thank your son for all that he did. It's in your son's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and, and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. I travel down the
upon the first day of the week, as Christians, we come together to store a portion of God's word, to fellowship one with another, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to bring into remembrance the things he did for us. A sacrifice so great, so powerful, that it can save us. Take a man from a sinful world and get him into heaven through obedience. His broken body, the stripes he took, all for us. The blood he shed, the punishment he took, all for us. That's love. Our God gave up his only begotten son because he loved us so much. Will you go to me in prayer, grass, blessing upon the bread? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the love that you have for us, that you allowed Christ to come to earth. come to earth to teach us and to be that sacrifice that was needed the sacrifice needed to be able to get us into heaven this bread which represents his body which was so cruelly beaten and placed upon the cross we ask that you bless it and bless those that are about to partake this we ask in Christ's name Amen with me again please to gracious heavenly father again when you come to you in prayer asking your blessing upon the fruit of the vine fruit of the vine which represents your son's blood which was shed on the cross for us and through that blood we have salvation we ask you to bless the fruit of the vine and those that are about to partake this rest in Christ's name Amen. <clears throat> the Lord's Supper has now been completed. As we assemble today, we have opportunities to give back to the work of the church. For the blessings we have in this country, for the blessings we have within the church itself. We bow with me, please, we go to prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this country that we live in, for the many opportunities that we have. We know we are but stewards of the things that we have and everything belongs to you. We ask you to bless those to give back to the work of the church freely, not grudgingly. We ask you to bless them and guide them, Lord. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. If you're able, you please stand. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No.
I was tempted to run up those stairs, <clears throat> but then my mind kicked in and said, those running days are over. So good to be here today in the Lord's house, worshiping with brothers and sisters in Christ. And how important that is. We come to worship, to worship the Lord, and we're grateful for this opportunity. As many of you know, David is in uh, with uh, is with Rachel this weekend, and uh, so I'm filling in for him. We're going to be talking about miracles, and one of the things, one of the questions, one of the main questions that comes up is that that miracles are to perform today. In many minds, miracles do last forever until the time shall be no more. And yet, there's perhaps no clearer teaching in the Bible than to show that miracles was for a particular age, and when that age ended, miracles ceased. Well, I make that statement, can I prove it? Can it be proven by the scriptures? And I hope that you will uh, stay with us as we look. I want us to turn to John 2, verses 1 through 11, because this, it's important that we get the, the background of what we're talking about. This is John 2, verses 1 through 11. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus... Uh, was called and his disciples to the marriage. When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of a stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, uh, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of the miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. This is the, the record where Jesus first began miracles, and miracles were an integral part of the life of Christ. All throughout his ministry, there were miracles that were performed, and not just by him, but done by his disciples as the Spirit was given unto them as well. But I think it would be important this morning if we could get what is a good definition of a miracle? What are we talking about? Now, before we go uh, any further, I do want to make uh, clarify something. When I'm talking about a miracle, I'm talking about a Bible miracle. Many people today speak about the birth of a child as a miracle which it really is not. It's a phenomenon, that's certainly the case. But according to natural law, when man and woman come together, then there can be the birth of children. And so there's a process that we understand that they go through. But a genuine Bible miracle was that which was performed in the Bible. And those are not being reproduced today. Now, having said that, can we prove that? A miracle is an event which the forces of nature, including the natural powers of man, cannot of themselves produce. 
and which must therefore be referred to as a supernatural agency. Now let me boil that down and put it to you in common words. Any event, anything that takes place that people think is a miracle, if it cannot be reproduced by man, it's not a miracle. That's where we see then it would have to be the supernatural powers of God that were involved. Many people today <clears throat> talk about raising of the dead. I remember through my preaching career that various cities, they would have a huge tent put up and they were advertising a meeting uh, so-and-so was going to become. And on the last day, he's going to raise one from the dead. And this would draw people. You know, they've never seen a phenomenon like that. Did they actually raise one from the dead? Let me give you an illustration that literally happened on one occasion. There was this tent meeting, and they'd been advertising. And so the last day of the meeting, they brought in a casket. And lo and behold, there was a person in that casket, all dressed up in a suit and tie and everything. And uh, they selected a police officer from off the street to guard the casket that no one would do anything. And he was getting at the point that he turned to the casket and he's about to raise this one from the dead. And the police officer said, ladies and gentlemen, to prove to you that this person is dead, he pulled out his pistol and when he pulled the hammer back, that person set up. Well, I wasn't dead in the first place. And that is oftentimes what is put over on people, though they claim they can raise one from the dead. If this definition, and it's one of the best ones that I have found, when you cannot reproduce this in a natural way, then it's beyond the realm of nature. It's supernatural. That's by the Fisher. A miracle, then, is a divine operation that transcends what normally is perceived as natural law. You can't, or you can take natural law, but you can't reproduce what was done. That was the idea. It cannot be explained upon any natural basis. Let me give you an example. The virgin birth of Christ explained that or try to explain it without a miracle being involved. Why, if that was the case, why not are not many of our virgin uh, young ladies? Why are they not producing children? Mary was in that condition, and she did. But we understand the act that must take place, but it was a biblical act because here no man served as the agent, okay? And so the, vir the virgin birth of Christ certainly helps us to see that. Now, I want to go on record as saying that I believe, and not only I, but I know most all, if not all of you, believe every miracle that is found in this book, every one of them is accurate and did happen. And that's very important because we're going to be looking at some things that I want you to see. Oftentimes, people, when we talk about miracles, people will say, they'll talk about something. Uh, well, uh, this baby was born and had a hole in its heart. And uh, by the time it went home, that hole was healed. Well, that's a phenomenon. I may not be able to explain that. I don't know the medical terms and, and how that is, but I know that that's not a miracle. I know that, that oftentimes that happens and it, it will heal itself within that. So every phenomena that takes place that we cannot personally explain, that's a miracle. So I'm making a distinction of what people say in the world and what the Bible says. I believe every Bible miracle. Now, as a general rule, the, mira the miracles of the Bible era were done in the presence of multitudes of credible witnesses, sometimes even hostile enemies observed it. 
But Bible miracles was not something that was done in, behind closed doors where no one else could witness it. It was always open. It was always up front so people could see, could understand what was taking place. Now, truly, the signs of Christianity were validated because they were not done in the corner. Look with me, if you will, in Acts uh, chapter uh, 26 and verse number 26. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. It was that which was always open and before people, and they understood that very act. Genuine miracles were not slow. They were not progressive. It was a process. Rather, they uh, re produced instantaneous results. Now, I know that the scriptures does give us one case where a blind man w was healed, and he saw trees upside down. And then they went on to complete that. The context of that was showing the power of God. And, and so it was affecting that way. But you look at miracles. Miracles were genuine. They were not progressive, but they took place. You know, it's interesting how people can be limping on crutches or have a bad leg or something of that nature and go to one of these healing places and they'll immediately take those crutches and throw them away. And they probably could take a few steps without them. But what about the next day? They're right back in the same situation. There was no miracle that took place. It's all sensational. Listen, friends, this makes movies that people will pay money to go see. Because it's a phenomenal, it's beyond, you know, one's belief. This is what produces books. Many of books have been written talking about these things. I have a library that's full of those that are trying to explain and accept how miracles take place today. But they understand that they were instantaneous. Now, what was the purpose of Bible miracles? There were some occasions where one was not performed, but there were many occasions. And so let's look at the purpose. Actually, there are two reasons for it. Number one, the function of the signs was to confirm the word. In other words, here the message would be preached. A miracle could be performed, which confirmed that which was preached. Secondly, there was a, a, a purpose, and that was that it was to show that the man that was performing the miracle was truly a man of God. Listen to what John says in John 3 and verse number 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. How do we know that? For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Isn't that interesting? Nicodemus, who was not a believer at this point in time, later will become a believer. But Nicodemus saw the fact that not just anybody can do this. You have to have been one that came from Jehovah. And he recognized that he was. So those are the two reasons, to prove the man that was performing the miracle was genuine from God and to confirm the word that placed a blessing upon the word of God. Now, we move on to the fact that Bible miracles were to cease. They were not to last forever. And uh, we look at some things here. In 1 Corinthians 13, and I want to take the time to, to read this passage because I think it's very important to understand what's taking place. Here's what Paul says. Charity never faileth, but whether there is prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. 
But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love, or charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity or love. Now in this context, Paul was using the illustration knowing in part, and prophesying in part. And the fact is that revelation came f to different men at different times. It wasn't all produced in 1500 BC. God gave Moses a revelation, told him what, ha what happened in the creation and what happened all during the time throughout his life. And then there were those uh, other men that, that wrote and spoke, many of the prophets who wrote down. Uh, David, Solomon, and others uh, wrote down many of the things that are found in that Old Testament. But God revealed things specifically to each one of these. But it was always, now listen carefully, it was always in harmony with what had been preached, or what had been said, or what had been written. There was never any disagreements. So the spiritual gifts that is used here are temporary. He says, in the divine order of things. <clears throat> now, I find it interesting that Paul used three things, three of the nine spiritual gifts. The, all nine of them are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. But in chapter 13, Paul uses three of those. Now, notice that. He, he talks about um, in verse number 11, charity, love never faileth. But whether there be prophecy, that is one who could prophesy of the future, could tell of those things yet to come. He said they shall fail, whether there be tongues. Tongues is languages. There were many different languages. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, when they were gathered together uh, to observe those things, there were 15 nations that were represented there. But there's only 12 apostles. How is it that 12 apostles could speak in 15 different languages or tongues? They didn't. It is implied that there were some of those nations there that had the same tongue, the same language. So the 12 apostles could speak where everyone could hear them in his own language. But it's interesting that Paul uses three of those. He talks about uh, the, the prophecy, he talks about tongues, and then he says miraculous knowledge. There were those that were given that miraculous knowledge. There were some elders that were put in the church that had miraculous knowledge and helped guiding the church in its early days. Interesting, though, that of those nine, Paul uses those three. But what is his conclusion? His conclusion is that they're going to cease. Why? He said, love must abide. It is an all-encompassing regulator of our moral conduct, that we're going to operate from the position of love. What is the right and the loving thing to do? No man, no person has the right to be ugly, to be unkind to another person. And so we're speaking about how the, our moral conduct is going to come forth because that's what's involved. Paul selected these three gifts, illustrative. The prophecy is going to stop. He said miraculous knowledge is going to stop. And the first thing was not only prophecies, but tongues. He said there, there will be where people are not going to be able to do these things. And so interesting how he points that out. Now here would be the argument. We're going to set it forth in a basic 
ch syllogism, which the first statement is true. We're going to make another statement that's true, and we'll draw a proper conclusion. We'll watch how this goes. When that which is perfect is come, literally, the complete word of God. There was going to come a time when revelation was going to cease and that these writers will have written what we call the scriptures. And so when that which is perfect, the complete word of God is come. Then notice, then that which is in part, in contrast to that which is perfect, that is the piece by piece revelation. Remember, God didn't reveal everything at one time. And then all the writers refer back to that. It was over a period of time. So when that which is perfect, or that which is in part, that is this piece by piece revelation, will be done away. And that was what Paul argues much right here in 1 Corinthians 13. Therefore, we have the complete revelation of God, the scriptures, and what does that tell us? That genuine Bible miracles have ceased. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. That's the force of his argument. Now, is that the only one? No. There's another argument. Let's pick up with Acts 8, verses uh, 13 through 18. Remember, uh, here is the conversion of the Gentiles. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and uh, wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, two of the apostles, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord and that is by Jesus' authority. Then laid their hands upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Then we know what Peter went on to say to Simon, and his attitude was how completely wrong. Anyone who thinks they can buy the power of God does not have God in their heart, does not have the truth, is not living the truth, is not abiding by the truth, no, how, no matter how religious they may claim to be. That's one of the gemstones that is, that is made there. Now, let's look at the argument of Acts 8. The spirit was imparted through the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's why two men, two of the apostles, were sent down to Samaria was so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given after the apostles received it, after they were baptized in it. Then it was only received through the laying on of an apostle's hands. Now, there are no living apostles. Therefore, there are no miraculous gifts today. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to know that I love you and appreciate you. And I don't want you to take this next statement that I'm about to make in a wrong way. But if this syllogism that we've just given, this argument, if it's not true, please show where it's not. If not, why not? If it took the laying on of the apostles' hands in Acts 8 and they laid hands on them, we can see then that when the apostles died out, which they did by the end of the first century, there were no more miraculous gifts. But I want to give one final uh, argument based on Ephesians 4. And actually, this can be found in verses uh, 11 through 13, okay? In Ephesians 4. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till 
we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, thinking about those things, Paul was talking about here they had received some evangelists, some prophets, some teachers. They had received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That was given unto them. So what are we talking about? Paul went on to say that this would happen till, notice that, in the verse that we read just before, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Interesting, because some say, well, that means that uh, uh, we'll never be united completely in this life, so miracles must continue. Is that what Paul's saying? No, let's look closer. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, the system of faith. What is that? The gospel system. What are the implications of that? That when the Bible was completed, it would make them complete as well. Until we all come in the unity of faith, that is oneness. That we, and we, let me ask you a question right here. If we were to open our Bible into most any chapter, most any verse, and we read it, can I read it? Can you read it? Can someone else read it? And can we all help come up with the same understanding? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned or damned. Now, when we look at that, let's look at that a little closer. He that believeth and is baptized. Evidently, he's not talking about himself. So we have to put ourselves in there. Believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is there salvation without one believing and being baptized? No, absolutely not. He that believeth not, that is one who doesn't believe, believe this teaching, shall be damned or condemned. Now we all can see that, can't we? We all read the same verse, by the way, that was Mark 16, verse 16. And we all dealt with the very same verse, and we all came up with the very same uh, conclusion. Friends, that is vitally important. So, till we all come in the unity of the faith or oneness, when that happens, the partial will be done away. That was going to cease. Now, watch the logical conclusion. Therefore, the gospel system caused the partial to cease. Miracles lasted to the end of the first century. The apostles died by the end of the first century. Remember, took the laying out of the apostles' hands to receive it, and the apostles are now dead. And so those that they laid hands on, the, the power is there no more. And because we have no living apostles, we know that the gospel system, in its completeness, caused the partial to cease. Now, just want to make a couple of concluding marks here. The fact is that is exactly what was affirmed by the Apostle John. Notice in John 20, 30 and 31, when he talks about the signs. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's exactly what John was trying to say. He declares that the signs of Christ, which he records in his gospel account, are written. And that we have the Greek word there, which means uh, written by hand. God spoke it, and it was written down. It's perfect tense which means it has an abiding effect. Just like it stands written, even today. We can still trust and obey that which has been written because it's still true. That's the idea of perfect tense. Why? 
that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And friends, there's a great blessing when that comes. I trust that it has become abundantly clear that uh, since miracles in the Bible continue to accomplish the original purpose, and being now that has been transferred to the Word of God, there is no need for reputation. Why do we need miracles when the Bible teaches us the same thing? If it says the same thing as the Bible says, you don't need the Bible. If it says something different than the Bible, then you're going to have to make a, a decision. Am I going to trust the Word of God or the work of men? And so there is no need for a repetition of miracles today because the word of God in its completed form supply all things. As Peter said, all things that pertain to life and godliness have been revealed unto us. They are not being replicated in this age. So we understand that biblical miracles are not according to uh, to uh, the Bible being are taking place today. I hope this has been informative and, and will help us. We know that many people in the religious world are, are, are caught up and hooked on this and, and they can't see uh, why Bible miracles are not taking place. But I hope this has helped in answer of that. Now you see the plan of salvation on the, on the screen before you. One that will hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized into Christ, can have their sins forgiven. And then if we will live faithful to the end, God will give us a crown of life. Where are you today, my friend? Do you need to repent of where you have been and acknowledge that it's not where I need to go? Or perhaps you have been uh, seeking to live the, the Christian life, but you've stumbled. Pick yourself up and come back home to him and do that while we stand and while we sing. standing this won't take long the, um, everything you need to know I think is is in the church bulletin just read it keep in mind our sick list our ever growing sick list these people uh, the, the the only inclusion we, we need to add is Diane Newell is uh, sick and at home and not able to be here this morning so uh, just remember Diane uh, also it says here um, right here in the middle so it is just a little addendum. We will be meeting in room 110 Sunday evening and Wednesday morning and, and the evening services. Make your plans to be here and force us out of this room. 
in room 110 just to be frugal with the Lord's money to keep from running air conditioners and heating and cooling places that people aren't in we're just going to consolidate into that one room and uh, that's going to start this evening so uh, y'all come back everybody and uh, make sure that plan don't work make us get back in here to where uh, we can fill this room up with people that's uh that's all unless there's something somebody else has thank y'all come back this evening I tell you. Uh, Wednesday night we're having a prayer service, so y'all make sure to come out and let's pray. For It's a list that's on there that we're going to pray for just about the country and everything that's happening and the teachers and everybody. So y'all come back, make sure you be here Wednesday night at 630. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we've ended being here for the worship hour and the Bible study, we just thank you for that we have the opportunity to come and study a portion of thy word and lift up thy holy in that precious name. We thank you for being with Brother Clifford and Patrick as they led us today. We just ask that you be with this country, dear Heavenly Father, that we know what that we need to be doing, and we need to be lifting you up in everything that we do and say. So we ask that you be with us and forgive us when we fail in your Christ's name. Amen.